Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Larry Cook again. This is CH47 Rotor Systems. And today's class, first couple hours, we'll talk about the rotor system, then we'll take a break and I'll swap out and we'll do the APU systems. Page four, 411 in your student handouts where it starts. Today's terminal learning objective, describe the components, operational characteristics, functions, limitations, emergency procedures of the CH-47 Delta rotor system. The condition in a classroom, given your a CH-47 rotor hub on a stand, a rotary wing cutaway, swash plate, and operator's manual and student handout. And then when we take our test Monday, there'll be six questions on this block of instructions in which you must get four correctly to receive a go. Safety requirements are none, risk assessments low, environmental considerations are none. And to get on the test, it'd be 90 minutes long and you've got to get a go on this version or this block of instructions. Learning step activity number one we're going to go through, we'll discuss where some of the components are and then we will come back and discuss their operations. Our slider assemblies, our slider shafts, we have one on our forward transmissions approximately 18, 18 inches tall. And then we got one on our aft vertical shaft. The purpose is to vertically align and keep the swash plate in line as it goes up and down on, on those shafts. The swash plate assembly, we've got a forward swash plate, we've got an aft swash plate. They are identical in their makeup. The forward one is made up of an aluminum type material. The aft one is made up of stainless steel type material. The aft one can be used on the forward swash plate. The forward one cannot be used on the aft. Just have to keep an eye on which materials we got. When I show you the swash plate, I'll show you the different mounts for the drive arm. That will be the only difference in the hookup. LCTs, you talked about those during uh, flight controls class. What was the purpose of an LCT? What does the LCT function with? AFCS. AFCS. So it takes those AFCS inputs, kind of levels out the fuselage, takes some of the stress off of the airframe as we're flying along. Our fixed link is also amounted to our swash plate. What was the purpose of a fixed link? Stress under your uh, indicator. Your, uh, cruise Okay, together, y'all came up with that one together. For the cruise guide indicating system, it measures the stress that we're placing on our rotor system. And then our drive arm assembly, we will talk about it, we'll talk about what to look for in pre-flight. Our drive arm assembly does nothing more than drive, keep our rotating portion of our swash plate in line with everything else. Pitch change links, we've got three on each rotor head. We'll talk about those what their importance is, when we use those, and when we adjust on those. Our weather protective cover, plastic or fiberglass material between a rotor head and a swash plate assembly, designed mainly to keep out rain, snow, and dirt. You'll find out that when it rains though, that it will leak in several different spots. If you sit on the right side today, it's probably gonna leak on that side if it rains. If you sit on the left side tomorrow, it'll probably leak on that side when it rains. Our centrifugal droop stops, installed on the aft rotor head only, allow for a little bit more of the lagging in the blades that we need, keeps the blades from hitting the fuselage during shutdown. We'll talk about how they work. We'll talk about our forward rotor head, some of the differences between the forward and aft. Our rotor blade slash dampener, we'll discuss how it works. Our rotor blade dampener controls the amount of lead and lag that is in each blade that we have. And then we will talk about our rotor tax. We will talk about all our limits and some of those red marks that you have on there that you were pay told do are not applicable. We will explain what those are on there for. Learning step activity number two. Describe the components, operational characteristics, functions of the rotary wing control system. First thing we're going to talk about is our slider shaft. Our 
Again, earlier I said that it was to keep the swash plate, everything in line as it slides up and down. This is our slider shaft. This one's been around here for a long time. It's kind of gotten, gotten dull. When we pre-flight the slider shaft, you are looking for nicks, dents, scratches, any signs of wear. When we talk about the ball that slides up and down in a moment, you'll understand the importance of this being kept clean and it being kept smooth. It's made of a tungsten type carbide material. It's in your student handout, the material it's made out of. <clears throat> if you do observe any nicks, dents, or scratches, they need to be worked out before we go fly. We'll find out a little bit later I'm, uh, about the bearings on the inside of the slider shaft, but they're made out of Teflon. They're a smooth surface. This must be kept clean. When you go upstairs and you do a pre-flight, it's not a bad idea to ask flight engineer. Most flight engineers keep a rag or a stack of rags, shop towels, in their aircraft. Take one with you. If they didn't wipe this off, then you need to wipe it off. Keep all the dirt free of that area. There will be a stop. When this is installed, this one's the one off the forward transmission that prevents it from popping off the forward transmission. There's one a top stop on the aft transmission and there's a lower stop to keep them from to limit the movements on them. The swash plate assembly themselves consists of a couple of different components. Our stationary ring. This portion down here is our stationary ring. It provides a mounting point for our LCT on the forward. The LCT is going to be on the outside. Fixed link is going to be on the inside. When we go to our aft swash plate area, the LCT is going to be on the inside. Fixed link is going to be on the outside. They had to reposition because of the length of it. When they put it in the aft pylon area, it's a little bit smaller. They put it at a different angle. It's not really 180 degrees out from the one up front, but they are placed in a position that we're now that we can get control of movement and the same inputs forward and aft. It also has mounting plates for our upper dual boost actuators, our pivoting and our swiveling actuators. So there are four components that mount to the fixed portion of our uh, swash plate. The rotating ring. This portion up top, our pitch change links will install on here. The bottom portion of our pitch change link will be in this ear, this ear, and this one. You will notice that we have a place for our um, drive arm. One will be marked aft, the other one will be marked forward, depending on which rotor head we install it on. What did I say we needed to be aware of when we installed swash plates as far as the material? Aft one is made out of a stainless steel tougher material. The forward one is probably some kind of alloy, aluminum alloy or magnesium alloy. The stress required or stress that the aft receives would not take anything less than that stainless steel. Also, when we pre-flight this, I told you all ago that this needs to be wiped clean. The rotating portion of this wash plate requires a lot of grease. Now that's kind of counterproductive when we've got to have something that needs to be kept clean and then we've got to have something that requires a lot of grease. When these things spin, they get hot. So approximately every 25 to 50 hours, you'll see a flight engineer up top pushing in grease and they're going to put in a grease gun until they see grease squeeze out. They should wipe it off. When you go out to the aircraft and pre-flight, this work platforms and on pylons, forward pylon, aft pylon, you'll see grease slung everywhere. Make sure that it's all, that somebody keeps it all kept clean. We get grease on here, we go fly in a sandy area, that sand's going to get on there and it's going to start wearing the Teflon bearings out of the uniball that's inside the rotating portion of the swash plate. <laughs> there are some of the other components. This is the uniball that sits inside, sits inside the stationary ring that slides up and down when we make our movements. Inside there is Teflon. And that's another reason. Teflon and grease do not mix well together. The grease will eat that Teflon up. 
and then it will start eating into this lighter assembly. But the ball is kept inside the station, the rotating ring. It's popped in there with a couple of rings at the top and at the bottom. That's what keeps it from popping out. These rings are locked in place on the inner side of this to keep this bearing from popping out. Any questions about the non-rotating or the rotating portion of the swash plate? What are the four components mounted to the non-rotating portion of the swash plate? LCT. LCTs, fixed link, upper dual boost actuators. The ball is spherical, I just held it up. You can see the snap rings on the inside of it located here that hold those two Teflon bearings in place. LCTs and fixed links, again, they're going to be swapped around. On the forward, LCT is going to be on the outside, fixed link on the inside. When we get to the back, they will be swapped. And again, the LCTs, their function is to take off, take away some of that stress in the airframe, kind of level the airframe out as we fly along. The fixed link, it's a pivot point, kind of a pivot point as there is tilt put into the swash plate, a pivot point between the LCT and the other control movements that are put in there so that it can make sure that we get the correct inputs forward and aft and detect the amount of strain put on the system. All right. The drive collar. Without the drive collar being installed, there would be a big mess up top of the aircraft. This is how it should be installed on the swash plate, forward swash plate assembly. When it's installed, you'll see that on top of it, it has rings. And then it should be Murphy proof. There is a key on this that will align it up with the transmission mount or the aft vertical shaft slider shaft at the top so that we cannot install it in the wrong place. This becomes very important when we're doing phasing of the rotor blades. But it will be placed on top. It will be hooked up right here. Its function is to drive, <coughs> drive the rotating portion of the swash plate and keep our pitch change links in line. When you go out in pre-flight, you are going to be looking for play in the upper, upper bolt and the middle bolt. Now, how much do each of our blades weigh? I said it during the inter introduction, but that's been many weeks ago. Anybody remember? 350 pounds. So we've got six on each rotor head. That's very heavy. When our rotor blades are installed on the aircraft and the rotor heads are not locked out and the pitch change links, all that weight's down on here. So if I go out and I suspect that there's play here and I start moving things around, pushing it back and forth, besides my strength, I've got the weight of those rotor blades on there. So I am probably creating play or I'm making an optical illusion when I do that. If you suspect, if you look up there and you see a little black grease coming out, get the flight engineers to get the TIs to check it. Because again, if I grab these pitch chains like, like a monkey and I start swinging them back and forth, I'm going to start creating play in these areas. And you'll see that when you go out in pre-flight, unfortunately. Crew members and pilots thinking that they're looking for play, doing something good, and they're just making play in there. Again, if you suspect it, just call somebody and have them check it properly. Crank the APU, center the controls, take some of the weight off, and they'll check it. There are hat bushings on the inside, make sure that they're installed. And again, make sure that it's installed. If it's the forward rotor head, it should be marked forward. They probably would not be able, if they hooked it up wrong, probably would not be able to get the rotor system phased correctly if they did not do it. There's the drive arm assembly in our pictures. Upper drive arm, lower drive arm, and then the collar. It is broken down into three pieces. 
They have retention bolts in them. The hardware on our rotor system should always, it should come from any aircraft. Which, where should the bolt head be faced on the rotor system? In the direction of rotation. So when these positive retention bolts are placed in there, we've got to make sure that we're putting them in the direction of rotation. That way if a nut breaks off, that it won't slide off. Another protection they've given us, besides putting it in the direction of rotation, positive retention bolts have the little snap ring on them. So if the nut does break off, they should not be able to pull themselves back out. But you should look for them to be Carter keyed and that positive retention bolt be installed. Pitch change links. There are three on each rotor head. They are identical. When we start talking about the red pitch change link, the green pitch change link, we reference those to whichever rotor head blade that they may be tied to. But we do not, for some reason or another, do not mark these. Each one of them comes at a nominal length and we adjust them to whatever they need, may need to be for tracking balances purposes. One of the, some of the things we need to look for when we pre-flight these, they will be installed there. You look for the positive retention bolts to be installed with the Carter keys. There should be an angle, an offset. You can see that the lollipop at the top is offset from the lollipop at the bottom. That allows it to sit in the bottom on the rotating portion of the swatch plate and into the pitch horn without binding to one side or the other. When I pre-flight, if it is pushed to one side on the bottom, when I look at the top pitch horn, this should not be touching. If it is, someone probably, when they were adjusting the pitch change link, broke a shear pin on the inside. There is a shear pin to keep them at these angles. When they break these loose, they have to put a, a wrench on the top and they've got to take a wrench right here and break those nuts loose. Sometimes they will just put a wrench here, try to break it loose, and again there's a shear pin on the inside here to keep them at that angle. They would snap that shear pin, which would allow these things to move during flight. Then they would start binding and eating into these ears. You will look for the bearings, the Teflon sticking out of the bearings for playing those. Uh, there are two different types of bearings out there. There are some like these these are the Teflon type. These should be the mostly in what we have on the aircraft. And then there are the elastic numeric bearings. On these pitch change links, there's also Carter keys and a safety wire. You need to make sure that that's there. And you can see the little white tick marks. When we go out and we balance, the air, balance and track the aircraft, these little white tick marks, when you get with a maintenance test pilot and they tell you aft rotor head, aft green blade, we need to move it up three clicks. They're talking about each one of these little clicks. <coughs> we have many wonderful test pilots out there because our, our machinery really doesn't work that well with the tandem rotor system. And they learn how through looking at what the machine put, prints out for us versus their experience and they get our aircraft tracked pretty well. Because if I move it a cl one click, it probably moves one blade one inch, but it affects another blade somewhere else. So they really learn how to do that very well. How do you guys use a torque to get the little cotter keys to line up? <laughs> how do we get these things torqued properly with those little Carter keys? It's very tricky. <laughs> you put it, what they'll do is they'll put it to the minimum torque, and then they will put it to, they'll get it torqued, they'll go to the max torque and move it ever so slightly till they get a, a hole lined up trying not to exceed that max torque. But those Carter keys have to be there. They're important. Now that we talked about the pitch change links, I told you about the weight on the rotor head and the importance of the drive collar. On the rotor head, if I was to disconnect this drive collar with the rotor head locked in, and I'll explain that in a minute, with all that weight there, what do you think would happen to those pitch change links?
with the rotor head with all the weight the blades on them, they're going to push down or they're going to pull up a little bit, which is going to make the pitch change links shift to one side and then the swash plate's going to go up. How do I know that? Unfortunately, I've seen it happen too many times. People will go out there if they'll need to replace the center bolt and the drive collar, and they try to do it the tricky way. They'll crank the APU, center everything, push a bolt out and think they're going to put one in real quick, but that'll fall, the weight of the rotor blades will push down, and the, car, the pitch change link will move to one side. So it's very important. When you see something like that happen, you know how much stress is really on, on the inside of that. The weather protective cover, again, it's fiberglass. To prevent rain, snow, dust. In the desert, it's very important for the dust. Check it on pre-flight for cracks. You check the boots that are installed there. They should be zipped up, and they should be tie wrapped to the top so they will not get interf interfere with the movement of the pitch change links. Hook on those and rip them. When you suspect a crack, I found it easier when you suspect a crack in the rain shield since it's painted black on top. If you will take you a flashlight, put it on the bottom of it, and look through the top, any cracks will show through. And then they need to be replaced. Pitch change link that we're passing around, there are some of the components as it's broken down. Any questions about the pitch change links? Again, if you observe maintenance taking those off or anything, and you see them taking these off of the aircraft without marking them, stop them. Tell them that they need to mark them because if they don't, it's going to be hard when they get through with track or get through with their maintenance to track and balance it. If I take it off the yellow rotor blade, then I'll put it back on on the green. They're going to be really way off. Our centrifugal droop stops installed on which rotor head? Aft rotor head. They are designed that once we start the aircraft up, that they'll fall away so that the blade will have plenty of movement, the flapping movements for our, our flights. When we get ready to shut down, when we reach a certain rotor RPM, the centrifugal droop stops should come back up. You have a procedure during shutdown where you call back to your flight engineers before you get clear to shut the engines down to make sure droop stops are in. It's pretty hard with that being black and the rotor head being black to be able to see those droop stops being properly in and out. So they should have placed some reflective material to make either a T or an H bear on the back of the rotor head. It makes it easier to identify that, especially at nighttime as they shut down. Make sure the droop stops are in. Has anybody discussed to you what happens if a droop stop does not come back in? What do we do? We looked at, they hadn't talked about that on the flight line yet. If the droop stops fail to come back in, you've got a couple of options. You can take, call the fire department. As long as the arm did not break off, call the fire department. They will bring their truck out and they'll shoot a stream of water up underneath the aft rotor head to try to push it back in as you shut down. If that fails to work or the droop stop arm broke off, then you go back on the landing gear and you get a mattress put it on the left side of the aircraft because our rotor systems all come in from the left side of the aircraft and then put it up there and let the blades hit it and come off. It's possible, very unlikely, but it's possible to shut the aircraft down with the droop stop fail and it not hit the rotor system. I've seen it happen once, but it, most of the time it will strike the side of the aircraft. Some of the things you need to look for on pre-flight the limiter springs, the spring, and then there's a limiter on the inside of it. <coughs> springs are going to sit back there and they're going to vibrate. The spring, the purpose of the spring is to bring it back up during shutdown. The limiters that are inside the spring prevent it from going so far whenever we're flying. The centrifugal force will throw them out. The spring's made of metal, this limiter is made of metal, and you know that that spring during flight is going to vibrate. So they put a 
coating of plastic on the limiters to try to keep some of the wear from the, between the spring and the limiter. So that's one of the things you need to look for on pre-flight. I noticed in my days that these limiters, there's another one on the opposite side so they can slide in and out. They would begin to rub and get real thin in the middle. The limiter breaks, the arm's going to go too far down, stretch the spring and it's not going to come back up. And of course if the spring breaks, it's not going to pull it back up. So look for those during pre-flight. Also, on the droop stop springs and limiters, the attachment bolts, they should rotate. When you pre-flight those, they should rotate. If they do not rotate, somebody may have over torqued them and the ear will break off. And again, droop stop failure will not come back in. On the bottom of the droop stop arm, they got the imposer block. It's probably about an inch and a half, two inches thick. That's what falls up in between the fixed droop stops on the aft rotor head to hold it up as we shut down. And then I guess there is that H shape. Somebody put it properly put it on that rotor system so that we shut down at nighttime, we can actually see it. During the daytime, it's kind of obvious if one of those arms does not come back in with that spinning as fast as it goes, you can see one of those out of place. Any questions about the centrifugal droop stops? Okay. Learning step activity number three. Describe the components, operational characteristics, and functions of the rotary wing head. Forward and aft rotor heads. Some of the components that are on the inside of it that we're going to talk about. Since I have a rotor head up here, I may not go exactly with the and as it is in the student handout, but I will talk about some of the components. The nut the retaining head on top or the retaining nut on each top of each one of them. Again, this is called the Jesus nut retaining bolt. It's up there. Once it is placed down and torqued, there will be a, a little spacer washer that goes in there that fits in these slots to keep it from backing off. And then there's a snap ring. There is a lot of care put, placed in this that this will not back off. There is a tremendous amount of torque. You'll see them out there with the, with the uh, large tools the torque multiplier, it tremendous amount of torque. We've got our rotor hub, or our oil tank in the center. This oil tank, when you pre-flight it, you're looking for oil. This oil tank will provide oil for my horizontal hinge pins, for the reservoirs for each horizontal hinge pin. Horizontal hinge pin is there to allow for the flapping. And I've got one over there. I'll break it down and show you a little bit more how they're placed in there and how they're locked inside there. We've got another reservoir here. We look for oil in a sight glass whenever we're pre-flighting. And all these sight glasses have got to be safety. This one's called potato head or just an oil reservoir. This oil reservoir is for the pitch fairing housing for the bearings that are inside here. Out here, we have our reservoirs for our vertical hinge pins. Our vertical hinge pins allow for lead and lag. Earlier, I mentioned briefly, we'll talk about the dampener again, but our dampeners control the amount of lead and lag. Our vertical hinge pins allow for the lead and lag in our blades. Our vertical hinge pins are tapered so that they should not be able to be put in here dropped in the wrong way. They will only go in one way. They are Murphy proof. Pre-flighting that, you're looking for at least some exposed threads on the bottom and some exposed threads on top to make sure that it was properly torqued. And again, the side glasses. There's some on top and bottom. This is where I was warning you about mixing hydraulic fluid and 7808. 7808 goes in the rotor head hydraulic fluid will go in our dampeners. It's a place that where it can get mixed up. There's a transfer tube right here. 
that allows, when I put the oil in here, it allows for it to go to the bearings on the bottom. If that transfer tube starts to gel up because of the mixed oils, oil will not get to the bottom. On the inside of our pitch fairing housing, I'll show you our TT strap. TT strap holds the pitch fairing house onto our rotor head. And then on our rotor head on the inside, it's got the same little keys as our drive collar had. It can only be put on one way. That's so that we can properly phase the aircraft. When we do maintenance on our aircraft, like we remove a blade, install a blade, repair that drive arm, we need to lock our blades out. When we lock our blades out, they'll put a pin in right here and it will lock into the side. That prevents it, takes the weight off the pitch change links or because we disconnect the pitch change link so that we do not have that swash plate shoot up. If I had the, the rotor head hooked up and I took this retaining nut off, the rotor head's going to shoot up. Again, the pressure of the rotor blades pushing down on those pitch change links, the rotor head's going to shoot up, not causing a good situation. Again, how do I know that that's going to happen? I've seen it happen too many times. On my aircraft, maintenance had just installed a brand new forward transmission. It didn't get torqued properly. They were going to back the nut off, put a new nut on it and torque it properly. They took the nut off without locking that rotor blade out and it shot up off of that forward transmission, fell back down and that ruined a brand new forward transmission. So. On the bottom of it, there are, we'll show some pictures of a moment. There's fixed droop stops, some that are there all the time to prevent lagging from down on the airframe. I'll show you those on a slide and show you what to look for. <coughs> okay, I'll try to just briefly cover it a little bit. We'll try to go over some more of these things. A the horizontal hinge pin. Got one here to show you. This is the horizontal hinge pin on the inside that allows for the flapping of their, yeah, the flapping of their blades and rotor hit system. This is our pitch bearing housing, our pitch bearing. It goes inside there, and the side the housing. The horizontal hinge pin will go inside here. And then we will take our TT strap, run it through there, and we will lock it in. I don't know if you've looked at any of the TT straps out of any of the other aircraft, but this is our tension torsion strap on the CH-47. It slides through that horizontal hinge pin through the housing, and it is attached on both ends with this right there. When you pre-flight the blades, really all you'll see or the rotor heads, is all you're going to see is a little bitty thin bolt that screws into the top of this to keep it in place. But never fear, this is what's holding your rotor system or your rotor blades on. 225 rotor RPMs, 350 pounds, it's a lot of stress on these TT straps. But they work good and put up with a lot of punishment. Looking at this one, usually when we get a TT strap, when they're new, they're all flat like that. This one has seen better days and has all the spaces in the middle of it. If you were to be able to see on the inside and we're looking for pre-flight one, you don't want those spaces. What do you think could cause a lot of stress on those TT straps? What's our rotor RPM limits? It. Ask a question. I should know. We're limited to 225, but when we start exceeding our rotor RPM limits, we put a lot more stress on there. And then that strip pulls, pulls these metals. As tough as this feels, it'll pull and stretch this metal. And then when it goes back, then you get those spaces that are there. So that's why they gave us those limits. Try not to exceed those limits.
pitch bearing shaft, I showed you that, the tie bar, the TT strap, and then the pitch bearing housing. There are fixed droop stops. During a break, you can look at those in the bottom of this one on the, on the uh, stand up here, but you will notice that they're marked forward rotor on the bottom. There is a difference between the forward and the aft. One of them is painted, I think the ones on the forward rotor head are painted yellow, the ones on the aft rotor head are painted white. They need to be placed on the proper rotor head. That prevents the droop of the blades whenever we shut down from hitting the fuselage. <coughs> The ones on the aft rotor head, the fixed droop stops. Because we went through this problem, these will be the fixed droop stops on the aft rotor head. That centrifugal droop stop, the imposer block, should be coming whenever we shut down, it should wind up coming back inside those fixed droop stops to prevent the droop. On the aft rotor head, on that one corner, if it's not installed properly, it should have a little angle in it like that to let this imposer block come up. If it's installed backwards or if they put the forward one on the aft rotor head, it will have that square corner. It will stop the imposer block from coming back in and then you've got droop stop failure. So it's very important when you pre-flight those to make sure that you've got the aft on the aft rotor head, forward on the forward rotor head, and that they are safety wired in. Especially you need to look at things like that if you know you went out during a post flight you need to look at them good. If you know you went out and you got into droop stop pounding. Did Tom introduce you to droop stop pounding? I think he usually does in this class. When do we get in droop stop pounding? Have you studied that yet? Yeah. When we exceed our ground control limitations, you'll hear the droop stop pounding. And in this aircraft, it can be pretty loud. <laughs> and that's just in the classroom, done very easily. When you exceed droop stop pounding, you're going to hear it. Out the, you're going to hear it in the cockpit. And that's what's happening. That is those droop stops hitting their, their limits, and they can actually be broken off. So when you get in droop stop pounding, get out of it pretty quick. Any questions about the fixed droop stops? The pitch fairing housing. We talked about it just briefly while I was up there by the rotor head. Uh, the bearings that are on the inside of the housing. When we go on break, you can get a closer look. But on the inside of the housing, there are roller type bearings. That allows the pitch bearing shaft itself to rotate and give us our uh, blade flapping. The oil reservoir, again, was the one on top that was a potato head. This allows the oil to drain down on the inside. If you'll take a closer look at that during break, you'll be able to see the little grooves that they've put inside the shaft itself to allow the oil to go down to the bearings. The rotor head insulation, again briefly I talked about the nut that was on top. There is that torque multiplier that we will use whenever we torque the forward or aft rotor head. There is a lot, a lot of torque. I honestly do not remember and that's a good thing. I, well, on page 18 of our student handout, it'll tell you that they're putting 6,000 pounds of foot torque on the rotor head. The only way to accomplish that will be with that torque meter. The oil system, I talked about all the rotor, the rotor head systems while we were up by the rotor head. Again, this slide will point them out. In the rotor system, we should be using 7808 to service the rotor heads. All side glasses should be at least half full. So you need to rotate the blades in to make sure of that? Or? That's a good question. Because of the pitch that is on the, the forward and aft rotor heads, to properly check the oil level, if you suspect one of them being low, you should pull it about 90 degrees out from the side of the aircraft. 
and check that rotor head, then pull another another blade out there and check that blade, those in that area, but 90 degrees off the side of the aircraft. You'll see a lot of aircraft out there that are spotted whenever you go fly. Look, they look like leopards because they've got oil leaks everywhere, and that's usually where it comes from. When we have it, when we develop an oil leak, you're allowed to go from full to empty in a two-hour flight. It just makes a big mess. Hopefully, they will replace them as soon as possible. Any questions about the rotor head up to this point? If there are no questions about the rotor head, let's take about a 10 minute break. All right, before we go any further, I try, I avoided this earlier because of, of the filming, but what we need to do is come back up here around the rotor head, everybody stand around it, and let's kind of briefly go over some of the things, make sure we're clear on the rotor head and how the things work. Okay, this is kind of a mixture probably of a forward and aft rotor head. This is our rotor head hub oil reservoir. This is the reservoir for our pitch, our horizontal hinge pins. Horizontal hinge pins, the oil will flow down, and each sight gauge belongs to each individual reservoir, whichever one it may be pointing to. And again, the oil will go down into these little ports and lube those roller bearings on the inside of this horizontal hinge pin. And then there's the Jesus nut, and then there's that little, that slot key, so that I cannot put a rotor head on the wrong way. Hopefully. I don't think there's a hammer big enough for that. Potato head, this reservoir I said was for which one? For uh, the one inside. For the, pitch, the, the pitch bearing shaft and the housing. They, you'll, there's little jets or little oil driven things, ports drilled for the oil to flow down and flow through there. This one out here is what? Vertical, vertical hinge pin. A vertical hinge pin allows for lead and lag in our blades. The, this allows for the lead and lag. The dampeners we'll talk about here in a moment controls the amount of lead and lag. Inside this one here, you can see the TT strap. We've cut it away and it kind, it, whenever the blades turn, it pushes it back in kind of a neutral position. You can see the bolts that are out here. Those bolts attach to that big thick pin that holds the pitch bearing housing or holds the pitch bearing housing to the TT strap. And then there's another bolt that goes through here at the top that mounts to another one of those thick pins that holds the TT strap on the other end. So you can't see that during free flight from the TT strap? No, sir, you cannot see it. I remember getting write-ups about a TT strap cover being torn, but I really don't know what what that would have been. I think there's a boot on the inside. When you look through right here, there is a plastic boot that covers the, the end of the TT strap. If that plastic boot is cracked or torn, any of these holes, I think you can feel back up in there and you might feel a piece of plastic. If they're torn, they need to be repaired, patched, so that moisture won't get inside and eventually damage the rotor system. Normally, there will be an L-shaped bracket that attaches between these two end pieces for the horizontal hinge pins. They have bolts attached to them. Once these are torqued, those bolts are put in there. It cannot back off, and those will be safety wired. Again, I noticed everybody up here while ago looking at our droop stops. Hopefully, you got a better understanding of how that imposer block comes in and locks up underneath the fixed droop stops on the bottom. Hopefully you can, next time you go out in your pre-flight, now that you've been aware of those are there, you can look for them better on the, on the aircraft. They, this rotor head will not line up and we can't get these things to work properly. So other than the, just the, the four and a half fixed droop stops, there's nothing precluding me from moving this rotor head to the front and back. Minus the drive link stainless steel. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference because of the yeah. direction of rotation. If you take this, one of them's going clockwise, one's going counterclockwise, the fittings on these pitch bearing houses. Now the hub itself, 
If I was rebuilding one improper rotor shop, the hub itself is okay. But when we get our pitch bearing houses, the direction of rotation is going to be on the opposite side. Yeah. You now you may get you may go at one time out there in pre-flight. Now you said that was a good question. You may go out there in pre-flight. This would be a forward rotor system. What are these things? You got any idea what those are? Is that where that? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Where this? I don't think it'd turn. Uh, for our fixed droop stops, when they come up here, this is the inboard mount. You may see this on the forward rotor head, no alarm, but that's only because they may have taken this this portion of the hub, or they may have just taken the reservoir itself and mounted it to the forward rotor head. No, no harm, no foul, won't hurt anything. Um, there are covers that they put on top on, that they make. When you get an aircraft and you get the flyaway kit and everything that comes with it, they put uh, covers on those droop stops, or they design covers. But I don't know a unit that has ever put them in because you cannot see the operation of the droop stops as they go in and out. A crew member can't call them in and out. Alaska, I've been told, may have used them once or twice, but again, ice would form on the inside of it, prevent them from coming back up. So those shrouds are probably not used anymore. While we're up here around the rotor head, is there any questions about it while we're here? Okay, well, we'll go back and we'll continue on with the class. I just wanted to make sure that we cleared anything up because I went through those slides probably pretty quickly. What's the oil that goes in there? 7808, silver can. Okay, our blade shock absorbers. The purpose of our blade shock absorber, I've told this a couple of times, is to control the amount of lead and lag on our blades as they go around. When we pre-flight these shock absorbers, we're looking for our bearings. Any play in these bearings, you'll see Teflon coming out or maybe a little grease, but these bearings need to be, need to be in good shape. There is a vent on top. On this vent, there's a flat spot on one side, or a little piece of metal on one side, and there's not on the other side. That is for to block the air during the direction of rotation to keep it from sucking the hydraulic fluid out because it has to be vented. Now to keep you from trying to figure out which way the direction of rotation is for whichever rotor head they've given you, they've put a little thing on the top of it that says mark this side up for the forward rotor head, turn it over, it says this side up for the aft rotor head. That's to keep it in the proper alignment for the direction of rotation so that it doesn't suck that hydraulic fluid out of the system. So you'll look for that vent, make sure that it's properly installed. And I think in our student handout, down on the bottom of page 19, I know I've skipped some of the stuff there, page 19, it'll tell you that we close it at temperatures above minus one degree Celsius, and we open it at temperatures below minus 18 degrees Celsius. That on bow legs B, open or close at temperatures between minus one degree Celsius and 18 degrees Celsius, there should be a minus in front of that 18 degrees there on bow legs B. Truth be told, there's no way in the world that you're going to be able to pre-flight this aircraft and tell whether I close or open this vent. The flight engineer, what they do is they back this jam nut, lock nut off, and they will screw. There's a slot on the inside of this for them to stick a screwdriver in, and they will screw this vent all the way in. The only person that's going to know is the person that did it. You can't tell. I've never had to change these. I've, been in, I've never been in a very cold environment. A place like Alaska, they have a set time frame where they'll say, okay, it's November, it's time for us to close these vents. They'll close them, keep them closed to the end of February or March, April, whatever the time may be, and they'll open them all back up. But all the other units I've ever been involved in will always leave them uh, in the open or closed position. They open them at the, the colder temperatures. I'll pass this around. You'll notice that there's a bullseye sight glass on the back of it. It must be in the middle of it. And again, 
when we check this, if you, bless you, if you suspect it being low, pull the tunnel, the blade over the 90 degrees out from the aircraft, and then check the bullseye. It should be inside that bullseye. You will see that there are vents, little holes drilled inside this piston as it goes in and out. That is how we control the lead and lag on the aircraft. It takes so much pressure for that fluid to go through and then so much for it to come back through the other way. When one of these dampeners get weak, you'll kind of feel in the aircraft, you'll feel a shuffle. There'll be a one-to-one -one somewhere in the aircraft that'll start shuffling. So when you go out in a pre-flight it and you see that a crew member has either put a grease marking on his dampeners, he's checking to find out which one of them, because there's six of them up top, which one of them is the weakest one. It will, it will of course, compress in, wipe that grease marking off to the weakest one, and you'll see this, which one has the shortest mark. That is not the preferred method because that grease marking can start damaging the seal. The best way for them to do it would be put a tie wrap on it. Push it all the way in, go fly, and whichever tie wrap's pushed out the farthest, then they will replace the dampener that way. That one has the regular Teflon bearings. We won't pass both of them around. This one has those elastic numeric bearings, the newer type bearings. The vent valve, the rod end bearings, we've already discussed all those, the reservoir, and the type of hydraulic fluid it is in your student handout. As far as I know, this is the only place on the aircraft that we use 5606. The fire resistant type hydraulic fluid can be replaced if there's no 5606 available, but that's what goes in these uh, blade shock absorbers. Where they mount to the aircraft, on the rotor head, there are bushings in the bolts, make sure that they are installed properly. There has been a problem with their mounts to the blades, and it's been out since the D model's been out. The bushings that are on the outside of the blade where it attaches are popping up. Whenever the bolt is mounted on the inside or the outside, with that hat bushing, there's usually a little gap between the hat bushing and the top of the bolt. That hat bushing is popping up. It used to be you couldn't fly. That hat bushing had to be pushed back down. It has become a problem they have not been able to solve. So, as that hat bushing can be popped, as long as there's no evidence of the bolt rotating on the inside. So when you go out to pre-flight, if that hat bushing on the blade root is popped up, there's no problem as long as there's not evidence of rotation between the bolt and that bushing. Any questions about the dampener? And its purpose in life is? Control. Control, lead, and lag. Learning step activity number four. Describe the components, operational characteristics, and functions of the rotary wing blade. They're big. They're huge like our big huge aircraft. They're 32 inches wide. Being 32 inches wide, any amount, small amount of inputs that we put into our controls really have a lot of effect on this aircraft. I was fortunate enough to have been in the system when we went from metal blades to these blades. I'm here to tell you, when we did an auto rotation with the metal blades, they weren't, they were probably about eight inches shorter or not as wide. When we did an auto rotation, it fell out of the sky. Now with these, the amount of the width that we've allowed to these, you've got a long glide path when you enter an auto rotation with these now. But they're 330 and a half inches long and they weigh, again, about 350 pounds. So you'll see several people on top of this aircraft. When we go out there and we do blade adjustments with our pitch change links, You'll see several people, and you may be involved if you help a test pilots out there trying to hold these blades up. They're, they are heavy. Some of the things that we need to be aware of are the titanium nose cap, the nickel erosion cap, the D-shaped spar that's inside of them, and the trim tabs. The trim tabs, our maintenance test pilots play with those for tracking and balancing. Our titanium nose caps, 
are to keep the blades from eroding, especially in the environment that they're in right now. I know during Desert Storm number one, we had a problem with the blades, the sand really eating the ends of the blades up. They went out and they put uh, a tape or a film over the outside of them. And as that film started to break loose, it started making some god-awful noises. So we really couldn't sneak up on anybody. It was really a noisy thing. And it would throw the aircraft out of track. On the end of the blade, we have our blade weights and our balance weights. Those are things, again, that the maintenance test pilots will pre-flight. But I want to point them out to you where they're at because these are some of the things you need to look for during pre-flight. If you go out and the aircraft is not in a test flight status, there may be tra uh, tracking tabs installed on the aircraft. They need to be taken off. There'll be a little flat piece of metal put on the outside that either has red or green or the yellow tape on it, or it may have X's with a dash on it. Those need to come off. Check for the bolts. Make sure that if it's not in the test flight status, that these bolts are installed and they're safety wired. The little plates on the inside is what we remove for the balancing of it during the blade tracking and balancing. Those come off during flight, there's no telling where they will go, so make sure that they're installed. The lightning protection that we have installed on, this, on these blades, it works good. On the ends of the blades, throughout the middle of the spar of the blade, there are some wire mesh screens so that if we encounter lightning and we get a lightning strike on our rotor blades, the wire, the lightning strike should come down to this port portion right here where we have lightning protection strips. If you encounter a lightning strike, this should kind of explode right here. There are some pictures on that Chinook-Helicopter.com of a lightning strike and you'll see where the fiberglass is kind of broken away. But this is to kind of help dissipate some of the lightning before it gets into the helicopter. If it doesn't get dissipated there, then we have the lightning jumper bonder cables where the, it can go from there into our rotor head and kind of be dissipated through the, at the aircraft. We had one at Fort Eustis that took a lightning strike overnight. You couldn't tell it. The only way to tell it was the left aft landing gear. There's a little wire cable that hangs down by the left, left aft landing gear. It was melted into a little ball but it didn't do any other the damage. It just went down the blades through those jumping bonders out the left aft left landing gear. But those are, the wire mesh screens are on the top and the bottom and so are the lightning protection strips. There's where the jumping bonder, the bonding jumpers are attached to the rotor heads themselves. If those are broken, of course you cannot take the aircraft into known thunderstorms or lightning conditions. Any questions about the rotor blade? Again, they're made out of fiberglass. When we say that the rotor blade's made out of fiberglass, we talk about the inside of it. That is a Nomax fiberglass. It's fire resistant. You do have the hollow shaped on the inside. You've got a bar going down the spar here to help for some of the structural integrity. And again, it's 32 inches wide and got that D-shaped spar. Learning step activity number five, describe the operational characteristics of the rotor tachometer. All right, let's talk about some of the markings that are on the gauges. You have your large needle and your smaller needle. Hopefully by now y'all know what the difference in those are, where one picks up from the other one. One of the first limits we need to talk about is 91, the maximum transit during operating limits. And then you've got in bow legs A and B. The generators come offline 82 to 85% RPM, and the generators come back on at 91%. That is why we have this. We do not really want to go below 91%, but we do know that if we do go below 91 and we come back up, that is where our generator should come back online. Your DECU on your 714 should not allow you to get down that low. 97 to 101 percent. It's our normal operating range. 102 to 105, transient power on. 106, 
transient power, max transient power on, and then 108, rotor rotation power off. Are there any questions about those? Y'all know what we mean by max transient power on and then max transient power? Okay, bow legs number five. Should 108 power off be inadvertently exceeded, then you've got to make a write up on the on the DA form 2408-1. Oh, no entry needs to be made on the 2408-1 unless we go above 111. And then we've got the 111 mark as our max transient or our max transient power off. Never to exceed 111 percent. Now there's a couple of markings on here. The 115, what does your checklist say? Not applicable. What they've done is everything in the Army inventory we've designed so that we can stay under limits to get as much max performance and max lifetime out of the aircraft. We used to have a max of 115. We brought it back down to 111 so that we could extend the life of the aircraft. That explains one of them. 96%. These gauges are all these markings. Most of these markings are on the inside. The 115 and the 96 are on the inside. I can't get rid of those markings. Those markings were there. Uh, this gauge was used in the Charlie model, so that's why the 96%. On the Charlie model, APU operational to get the engine started, you had to beep it up to at least 96% rotor RPM before you shut the APU off. Or we would shear a shaft in the aft transmission and lose our flight boost pumps, our generators, and our utility hydraulic pump because they were all on the aft transmission. These gauges also may be used in other aircraft, and until they're gone completely out of the inventory, those markings will still be there. Any questions about the gauge? Your permanent magnetic generator and your, and your, your generators mounted transmission mounted generators is where those pick up a signal. Tom should have talked about that a little bit during his engine class yesterday. Okay, there's the limits again. 91 minimum transit, 97 to 101 normal operation, 102 to 105 transit, max transit 106, max during auto rotation 108, and then max transit 111. Additional limits. Rotor droop stops and imposer blocks, page 9-21. That's just talking about what to do in case of a droop stop failure. Again, droop stop failure, call the fire department or put up the mattresses. Shock absorber vent valves, making sure they're open or closed during the proper uh, temperatures. And then in thunderstorms operations, our lightning straps, those cables must be attached to the blades. If they're not, try to avoid those conditions. Any questions about the rotor system? What drives the outer ring of the swash plate? The drive, drive collar, drive arm, drive, well, the drive arm. What controls the amount of lead and lag? The dampener. A fully articulated rotor head means that each blade can. Yeah, lead, lag, flap, and feather. And where are the lightning protection strips located? On the upper and lower portion of the blade. The, light, the bonding straps are the ones located on the root of the blade that attach to the rotor head, but the strips are the ones that are located on the top and the bottom of the blades. And then how will droop stop pounding be indicated to the pilots? You're going to get that loud noise. <laughs> It will go a lot faster than that, and you'll fill it in the controls. It'll be bumping 
and the crew member's eyes in the back are going to light up. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions for the rotor system class, let's take about a 10 minute break. Let me switch over to the landing gear. All right, any questions about the rotor system before we continue on with the APU system? All right. Next block of instruction is going to start on page 443, CH 47 Delta Auxiliary Power Unit. I do not have any TH 67 or OH 58 Alpha Charlie guys in here, so I can't pick on you. Our auxiliary power unit is almost their engine. <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, how close is that to that C 30R? Is pretty bad for the boat. I mean, it, it, for the C, that's, the, well, that's a new 58. The 58. The, I know on the OH-58 Alpha Charlie, they're, they're C20J. yeah, that's a C-20J. It has six centrifugal, one actual stage. We've got just one, uh, one actual compressor in here. So there's about a 100 shaft horsepower, you know, 270 versus 95. So there's pretty cl almost 200 difference in shaft horsepower. CH-47 Delta Auxiliary Power Unit, today's terminal learning objective. Describe the operational, describe the components, operational characteristics, functions, restrictions, and limitations of the CH-47 Delta Auxiliary Power Unit. In a classroom, given a student handout and our training aid. And again, on the test next Monday, going to have four questions on this block of instructions. Safety requirements are none, shouldn't have but a couple of small training aids to pass around. Risk assessment's low, environmental considerations are none, and we will be evaluated on this block of instructions and you've got to get a go during the exam to get a go on this block uh, for the exam. Learning step activity number one, LSA number one, describe the operational characteristics of the APU power, APU components. Hopefully by now, if you just got through finishing engine class, there's a lot of components turbine engine is a turbine engine. They all suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. They just do it in different areas and sometimes and in a different way. There should be a lot of questions that I'll ask on this that you should be able to answer. First of all, this is a model T62T2B. It's manufactured by Turbo Mach. Turbo Mach is a subsidiary of Rolls-Royce who now makes OH-58 Delta engines. Consumes 89 pounds per hour, it's rated at 95 shaft horsepower. It weighs 74.8 pounds without the generator installed on it. That's important mostly for your, your maintenance workers or your flight engineers when it comes to doing maintenance on this. Take that generator off and they can put it on their shoulder and carry it and get it worked on. It is a single stage centrifugal compressor slash power turbine. Whereas I was just stating a few moments ago that the, 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 the one to come out of the OH-58 Alpha Charlie was six centrifugal, one actual. We have a single stage centrifugal compressor slash power turbine. I will show you how that works as we go through these slides. Mounted at station, one, uh, station 600 in the back of the aircraft. The mounting points that are there in the back of the aircraft when you were pre-flighting them. Easiest thing to look for on the forward mounts, they are mounted on balls just like the engines, forward engine mounts on the aircraft. You look for a lot of grease, a little black graphite. If it starts to wear there, then it's probably wearing, the bearings are wearing and need to be retorqued. There are dog bones, I call them, in the back for mounting it, actual holding it in from going side to side and holding it at the top. These become important to our maintenance workers also because if there's a component that I have to change on the top of it, I can disconnect these aft mounts, disconnect my APU motor pump on front, and I can just swivel it down, change the component, push it back up. Some of the components that we're going to talk about, start accumulator. By now, since we've had utility hydraulics class, hopefully you can tell me a little bit about it. The APU start module, we'll talk about it again. The fuel shutoff valve. We should talk about where it's located and what you should look for on pre-flight with that. APU motor pump, again, we'll, of course, we'll talk about the APU itself. We'll talk about the ESU, our fault relay, where it's located at and when it comes in play. We'll talk about the fuel boost pump. Where is the fuel boost pump located for the APU? 
left inner tank area between the left main tank and the left aft auxiliary. And then next week you'll get a good fuel class I'm scheduled for, but we're going to let Mr. Borneman teach it for you. And we'll talk about our master cautionary advisory panel, what's on there for our APU, and then our electrical control panel. While I let this load, has anybody taken that disc and tried to play with the APU that is on there? This is part of the graphics of that, on that disc that we give out. Um, I don't think I can with this one, but I did show the class in the afternoon. And if you want me to show you after this class, I'll show you how to break this thing apart. But this allows us the graphics that are in here. I can rotate this and talk about any of the components on there. And again, that goes back to if you ever have any input about training, ingrain is where we want to go. That is a good training tool. Uh, sir, you asked earlier about the thickness of our student handout here for the APU, and this is a one hour class. This was designed through ingrain to give us, there's a lot of information in here, and I'm not going to talk about, I'm not even going to talk about half of it. It is there for your information. I will talk about during this 45 minutes what's pertinent to us on the flight line right now but this is good reference material to come back to. Some of the things that are on front of it. There's our APU motor pump. There's the accessory to reduction gear drive assembly for it. We'll talk about it. We won't talk about, have to remember the numbers. There's our fuel control for the APU. We'll talk about it and how it works. Our ignition unit, you've had an exciter box on your engines, now we've got an exciter box on the APU. Our combustor section. Our air inlet section, we'll talk about it, how it brings the air in, when it brings the air in. And then our AP generator, we will talk about it. 20 kBAs. Our oil sump tank. <coughs> Bless you. Those are some of the components that we will talk about in the next few minutes. Sections of the APU, again, the accessory drive, our compressor assembly, and our power turbine assembly. And I've lost my controller. Describe the principal operations for the APU. Air inlet section. We draw air in through the screen, and you can see it on our animation there, how it goes through our compressor and then back to our combustor, does its S turn and goes back out our exhaust. But our air inlet screen is located right here on this APU, so we draw it in and it has that wire mesh to protect it from FOD. Again, should be resemble the air, how the functions of the L714 engines work. The compressor section. Where air is drawn in from our air inlet, we compress it with our compressor turbine blade there. And then it's drawn back into our combustor assembly. And our combustor assembly is where all the magic takes place, the ignition and for a power turbine. Now a while ago, when I said it was a single stage slash, compre or slash compressor slash power turbine, the shaft that goes through there there is our compressor rotor and then our power turbine rotor on the back side of it, it is all one shaft. What happens is when I start the APU, we take that 3000 PSI from our APU start accumulator, it goes to our APU motor slash pump which starts turning the shaft. When that shaft is turning, it starts turning the compressor section, draws the air in. But while it's drawing the air in, it's also turning the 
turbine section all at the same time. Air is drawn in, it's ignited in the combustor assembly. Once the combustor ignites, APU becomes 90% speed, becomes self-sustained. Then the power, the turbine, or the combustor, the power turbine, will then start driving the compressor half itself. At no time will we have anything up here driving the compressor set, drawing in the air. The power turbine, as it needs speed and increases, will increase the amount of air that it sucks in, and then it will start driving a shaft, and then we'll drive my APU motor pump at that time. But it is one shaft. The, power, the combustor shaft and the power turbine shaft will spin at the same time. The reduction gear assembly, located on the front portion of the APU. It drives some accessory components like what on our 714? What drove accessory components on our 714? Gearbox. Accessory gearbox. So if you can relate it, the reduction drive assembly to the accessory gearbox on the 714, we'll be doing good. Some of the components that it will drive will be our generator, our fuel control and our utility hydraulic or APU hydraulic motor pump. No one will expect you to remember those speeds that we have on our slide. We've given those speeds to you in your student handout. But again, I don't think anyone should ever ask you those. The APU hydraulic system. APU start accumulator, the APU start module and our APU motor pump. Again, what I was just explaining a while ago. On the overhead control panel, when we go to APU run three to five seconds, what we are doing is we're energizing our little electronic sequencing unit, which sends a signal to my fuel boost pump and starts pumping fuel. So when you go to that run three to five seconds, what you hear, the little noise you hear, is the fuel boost pump kicking in and putting fuel to my APU. Then when I go to start, I release that 3,000 PSI that was in my APU start accumulator. That 3,000 PSI go, then goes to my pressure control module, to my APU start module, and then to my APU motor pump. Some of that 3,000 PSI turning the APU motor pump, turning the APU motor to motor the engine, and the other third part of that 3,000 PSI holding that wobble plate down telling it to be a motor and not a pump. There is this, the start accumulator. Again, it's for APU starts, some emergencies, and it can operate some of the utilities, the subsystems in the utility. The indicator on that should be reading 3,000 PSI. That will be system pressure prior to APU start. The APU start module, we talked a little bit about it in the utility hydraulics class. I think in one portion of your student handout, page 13, it says it's located at station 570. Somewhere between 570 and 584 is where this APU start module should be located. It controls the operation and mode of that APU motor pump. And then there's our APU motor pump. You can spin it around, take a look at it. Works the operations over on the inside is the same as the utility hydraulic pump that we pulled apart. It does have a wobble plate, but its function is to start the APU. Once the APU is started at 90% speed, then it becomes our pump for our utility system. Any questions about the hydraulic portion that we use on the APU or how it's used on the APU system? Y'all are a quiet class. Now then we're going to talk about some of the components in the fuel system. This is the aft left inner tank area. Located in that inner tank area will be our fuel boost pump and our solenoid valve. Both receive directions whether to operate or shut off from our electronic sequencing unit. This electronic sequencing unit should be operating just like when you talked about yesterday in your engines, the deck you. It monitors and controls the operations of the APU. The fuel pump supplies fuel at 70 to 40 PSI of pressure to the APU. And then in a moment, the APU driven fuel pump will talk about how much it boosted up to. 
our start solenoid valve mounted close to the boost pump and again it's controlled by the ESU. When we have a fault with the APU, if it picks up that the oil pressure is too low, the APU hot start, this is where it will cut off the fuel supply with that APU, that start solenoid valve. It will go through that APU fault relay that, that's in the airframe mounted behind this pump, tells the solenoid valve to shut off, and then APU should shut down. Our pressure fluid filter mounted on top of the APU. It's a paper type filter. There are no built buttons on this APU anywhere, so there's not a button to tell me if this fuel filter gets clogged. It is a time change item. If you're looking for this during pre-flight, just make sure that the lines are connected correctly. And there is an arrow on this filter telling us in the direction of the fuel flow. It should be pointing towards the back of the aircraft in the direction. Coming from the air, inner tank area, the fuel line hooks up here, and then goes to your fuel pump. And it can be hooked up backwards. It's not a Murphy proof item. So look for that arrow on this filter to be in the direction of fuel flow. The APU fuel control. We are very fortunate to have John Scott as one of our instructors because he has a lot of tools at home and he likes to take things apart. This is one of the things that he was able to cut apart for us. The APU fuel control is mounted right above the generator in the front part of the APU. On top of the fuel control, there is a little filter. You can see it when we pass this around. There is a filter. Again, no filter button. Start having problems with APU with the fuel system is about the only time we'll ever take this out and take a look at it. The fuel pump itself, now that we've delivered that 7 to 40 PSI of fuel pressure from the inner tank area with that fuel pump up until the APU fuel pump driven or the APU driven fuel pump, it will boost up the pressure to 400 PSI. The higher the pressure, the more we can atomize the fuel and it will burn better inside the APU. The acceleration control assembly, located here on the bottom. This is how we control the acceleration of the APU. It will keep it at 100%. If I reach up and I turn APUs online, I reach up and turn my generator online, I put a drag on the APU, it notices that with this flyweight governor, and it will increase the speed. It will, it will detect the, the drag it will start spinning at a different s speed and increase the fuel flow to get me back to 100%. Once I turn that generator back off, it knows the load's gone away. It will slow down and it will slow the flow of fuel down. But it keeps it at the max operating speed at all times. There's a metering valve with the altitude or bellows compensation on the inside of it so that this will allow us to operate the APU up to 15,000 feet. This is like a little accordion on the inside. The higher we go, the more spread out this little compensator will get, and it will allow for better fuel flow. Any questions about the fuel pump? How many PSI will that boost it up to? 400 PSI. Our main fuel solenoid valve located on top of the APU, up here on the top. This operates off 28 volts DC. It gets its signal from our electronic and sequencing unit. It allows the fuel to flow when we start the APU to all six fuel injectors. How many fuel injectors did you have on the 714? Do, do we remember? 28. 28. Good shot. We've got six on this one spread evenly throughout the back of the combustor. You can see those. Fuel, main fuel manifold, that is nothing more than this little wire running around the back side of the combustor allowing the fuel to flow from our fuel pump to the combustor section to our injectors inside our fuel pump, our entire combustor area, I'm sorry. 
And then our start fuel nozzle, our start fuel solenoid valve, I'm sorry, located on the opposite side. When we go to APU start, this solenoid valve will open up, allowing fuel to flow through this small line, going through an injector back here close to our spark plug. There is only one spark plug in this system, located probably about the 7 o'clock position. This fuel start fuel valve allows that injector to open up and allows fuel to spray onto that spark plug igniter. There's the start fuel nozzle assembly, a lot like the nozzles that were in your 714 engines. Any questions about the fuel system on the APU? Short and it's sweet. The electrical system on the APU. Your overhead control panel, the battery switch, two position switch, off and on, the APU switch is a three position switch, off, run and start. When I, while we've got the panel online here, can I start my APU with battery switch off? A lot of times people will ask me why would I want to, but yes I can. If I crawl in the cockpit, I reach up there and I turn my battery switch on. When I turn the battery switch on, my master caution panel should illuminate. You should start hearing some of the gyros start clicking and a lot of little noises in the cockpit. If those noises are low and those lights are weak, turn the battery switch off. Start the APU. Once the APU is online, battery switch on, generator switch on, and it will recharge the APU, or recharge the battery. But yes, I can start the APU, and if, if you really want to get home, once you turn that on and you've got weak lights, turn the battery switch off and crank the APU. A magnetic pickup. What's the, what's the ESU look for for voltage for a minimum to crank the APU? Got here it needs 24 or 28 volt DC. What does the ESU look for at a minimum voltage? And like he said, it needs 24 to 28. I would assume as long as it's close to that and it can draw, and that's the only draw off of the battery at that time, that it should be able to, to start it. I know there's been several occasions that's happened to myself, and we've been able to do it. But it, it does want, it's looking for the 24 to 28 Minimum, I couldn't tell you. You just got to hope that when you see that it's low, that you have enough left in it to charge to get that APU started. Magnetic pickup, have we seen these before? Located in our, our main generators on our aft transmission, pick up our rotor RPM. Well, we use the same thing here in our reduction drive assembly, a magnetic pickup mounted at the 12 o'clock position of the rotary to the kind of to the rear. It will pick up the speed of the operation of the APU. If it detects any, any movements in the speed, that's how it controls the oil pressure switch, the fuel flow. We do not have an indicator in the cockpit. Before we used to have an N1 gauge to tell us where their speed of our APU. No longer do we have it, we have that magnetic sensor. Exciter box. You had an exciter box on the 714 engines. We've got an exciter box here. What's the purpose of the exciter box? Exciter box does nothing more than boost that, that 28 volts. Yeah, it converts it to a high energy AC output. That's all it does. Without that, then the JP8, when we don't have glow plugs in this, like your diesel cars have, that where they can heat it up and ignite it. So we have to make our spark hotter, and that's how we do it. And you'll find out you had an igniter box on your engines, you've got an igniter box on your APU, and then next week when we talk again about environmental, you're going to have an igniter box on your um, heater. Uh, exciter box sends a sig it sends its signal to the spark plug again, located at the seven o'clock position. The event time meter located on the top of the APU. They're on the side towards the top.
This is how we keep track of the starts and the hours on the APU for any maintenance. In the past, you had as the IP, it was your responsibility. Every time I cranked the APU, I had to make a little tick mark somewhere. I had to count, I had to mark the time, how long I operated APU for engine start, engine shut down, if I used the APU sometime during the mission. Now this does it for us, the event time meter, a Hobbs meter. The APU is good for 6,000 starts and then is removed for the aircraft and this will track those 6,000 starts for us. When you were the pilot, when you were keeping up with it as the pilot, after you did your mission, along with logging your flight time, you used to have to put APU usage on there, APU starts and hours. Our APU oil system, again, I have to relate it back to our engine 714s. We have an oil pressure switch. We have oil filters, oil pump, oil sump. Our oil sump, a bowl type, located on the bottom portion of the APU in the forward part. It's mounted on the reduction drive and it, retain, it contains a sight glass. Inside that sight glass is a little aluminum ball. That ball must be in the middle of the sight glass when you check for your oil level. One of the other things you want to look for when you're pre-flighting, and it may sound small, but this blue cap must be off to the side opposite of the generator. If this oil sump was turned in any other way, that blue cap would be up front under my APU motor pump, telling me that nobody's servicing this APU properly. If it was turned over here to the side, it'd be under the generator where they couldn't get to it. Or if it was turned to the back, they wouldn't be able to get it out. So that's one of the things to look for on pre-flight, that that's in the proper position. On the bottom of that, it contains a magnetic plug. This is not a chip detector of any, any sort that, we can, that you can relate to on any aircraft. On the TH-67 and the OH-58, you had a plug like this on the bottom of the freewheeling unit. It's just there. It will collect magnetic particles in the oil, but unless you open the drain plug to drain the oil and look at it, there's not a requirement. It's not electrical hooked up to any light in the cockpit for a chip detector. It's just there. Our oil pump, gear driven type, produces 15 to 40 psi of oil pressure during operations. Our oil filter, again, no filter button, but it's located right here on the reduction drive opposite the generator. It's this little funny shaped thing that has a hole in it. To replace the oil filter, they've got to use a snap ring and then they pull it out. It's just not anything we check for in pre-flight, but it is there. That is the oil filter. 10 micron disposable type filter. It is a time change item. Oil pressure switch. Located right here on the APU on the right hand side. Any time after the APU is started, the oil pressure drops below 18 PSI. This oil pressure switch will send a signal to our ESU. The ESU will shut the APU down. It will go to the fault relay and shut that fuel solenoid off, depriving the APU of fuel, and it will shut down very quickly. But any time it drops below 18 PSI, other than during start, it will shut it off. Our manual fuel shutoff valve. Has everybody noticed where this is located in the ramp area? On the number one engine side. This is where people like to play pranks with people and people don't think about this APU fuel shutoff valve. I don't necessarily remember whether or not sometimes it's in a checklist, sometimes it's not. But when you're in the ramp area, you check this APU fuel shutoff valve. If that valve, if the knobs on top are in line with the line, it's open. If the little tabs on it or crossways with the line, it's closed. You get into a place, this is a place where people like to play jokes on people. In Korea there were two units, the Black Cats and the Innkeepers, 213th, 271st. 271st, when they went to work, they had to walk through the 213th flight line. Well, if they knew Tom was going to fly today and somebody from 271st was going to play a joke with Tom, as they walked by his aircraft, they'd open that panel, close that fuel shutoff valve. Tom would go out, pre-flight the aircraft, get it ready, pilots pre-flight it, get it ready, go, start the APU, starts winding up, and then you hear it go back down. 
Tom not thinking about this fuel shutoff valve gets back there and he pumps it up. Start the APU again and you get that beer. And now Tom's crying because now I've got to fix APU. But this is a big culprit of that. When you pre-flight, make sure it's open. Some emergencies, there's not required, but if APU catches on fire, maybe shut that valve, shut the fuel flow off. And it says use to shut down the APU during emergencies. I do not think you have an emergency procedure in your dash 10 that tells you to shut that valve, but it's a good thought to start thinking about. APU catches on fire, shut that valve off. Electronic sequencing unit mounted it on the left side, station 585, and it's got bite indicators on the side of it to tell us when things go wrong with this. This works a lot like your DECU. It monitors the operation of the APU. From the time we place the switch to run and start until we go back to off, this is monitoring everything that happens with that APU. It monitors the oil pressure, it monitors the fuel, monitors the temperature for over temp, and the speed that it's, it's going at. When we get a bite indicator the APU fails, you're going to have to try it again. Instead of the flight engineer standing in the back watching for a fire start, the flight engineer will watch this bite information. The first set of codes at the top portion, the first five, it will go through those. Then it will stop. Okay, maybe it's two whites and two blacks. It's telling me that the main fuel signal went out at 14%. And then I'll look, it will jump to another set of bite indicators. And along with what it told me there versus what it tells me down here, as a flight engineer or crew chief or a maintenance person, I should be able to fix it from there. So I shouldn't have to pump it more than two times before I have the problem resolved. There are two different types of ESUs out on the fly, well three, the ones that go in the UH-60, the ones that go in the CH-47, they look very similar, but now we are going to one that has five bite indicators. Hopefully they will give me better information on those than that fail to start. Describe the start procedures, operational restrictions, and emergency procedures of the APU. Any questions about the ESU before I go any further? Well, does that ESU operate the same? You need to ensure if you are going to check it for a bit indication you have to turn a battery switch off and reset itself. He's asking about the turning the battery switch off. That used to be a caution that we had. If the APU failed to start, if you reached up there and turned the battery switch off, it reset. But now until we go back to, it, it will stay where it's at until we go back to start again. Then it will reset itself. So now we can turn the battery switch off. This is a good question. Describe the start procedures, operational restrictions, and emergency procedures of the APU. This is how a while ago, or during the utility hydraulics class, I knew that at 90% speed, the first thing that it does is recharge the APU start accumulator tells me in this chart. This event time meter, if the APU fails to start and it doesn't reach 14%, it won't register a start on this time meter. This is telling you exactly what's going on at any given time during the start procedure for the APU. Now this is a good thing to know as a flight student coming through here but it's even going to be more important when you come back here and go through IPC. You may be asked about a lot of these things. APU control switch on the overhead panel. Three positions, off, run, and start. If we go to run, three to five seconds, what happens? What did I do three to five seconds? Fuel pump. Yep. Okay. He he answered it correctly. Three to five seconds. I opened up the APU fuel pump and the fuel solenoid valve, getting fuel back to my APU. Now it's sitting back at my APU, ready to start. I go to the start position, and then all the magic happens. APU on light should come on, or yeah, it should come on, and utility hydraulic light should go out within 30 seconds. If the APU fails to start, 
Uh, I don't know what portion this is located in here, but if the APU fails to start, I have got to wait one minute before I attempt to start it again. And unless you're fortunate enough to be in one of these units, I hear there's a new MWO coming out putting the electrical pump in the back. You're not going to have anybody to pump it up in less than a minute. But it, that is a restriction. If it fails to start, I cannot start it again until I wait one minute. Tail in the wind, the restrictions. APU shall not be started with a tail wind in excess of 25 knots. This should not concern you as a pilot because you have a greater restriction with the engines, don't you? I can't start the engines with a tail wind greater than 10 knots with the engines. The APU shall not be started with a tail wind in excess of 25 knots. I turn the aircraft around. You will find that there are a lot of inventive flight engineers out there have a lot of thought. You will go out there, you'll pre-flight, you'll see that the flight engineer in the back has his ladder strapped around one side of the seats. On the other side, he's probably got a room, broom stuck up between some ropes. You'll see those brooms burnt a lot. And that's how they overcome that 25 knots. So they'll place a broom up there in the back, start the APU, and it catches the broom on fire. One of the things I like to tell you about, though, when we talk about this, you shouldn't start it, but we're talking about the area back there at the tail cone for the APU. I want to warn you about a couple of things. It was more in Hawaii than any place else, prevalent in Hawaii than any place else I've seen. But here we have some four day weekends. It's getting springtime, the birds are flying around. It's kind of hard to see inside that tail cone. Try to back up a little bit and look inside. If you go on a four day weekend and these aircraft are sitting out there, there is a plug that goes in that tail cone at nighttime when you shut the aircraft down. First of all, you need to make sure that plug's removed. It's hard to see if it's stuffed in there. If somebody's removed that red remove before flight tag, it's hard to see that plug. But if that plug was never put in there, that bird builds a nest, you go up and you start the APU, the APU is going to fail to start. It's going to start, that bird nest is going to catch on fire, the temperature is going to get hot in the combustion area, the ESU is going to pick up, there's an over temp, and it's going to shut it back down. If you leave that plug in there, the APU is going to start. That plug has a rubber seal on the outside of it. The rubber seal is going to catch on fire and it's going to roll down the flight line. But those are some of the things to be aware of when you're pre-flighting that area. Check the winds, check for that plug, and make sure nothing has built a nest in it over any length of time. Emergency procedures. Hmm. This one is going to be scenario driven. In flight school, we beat in rote memorization, rote memorization. APU fire, what is my emergency procedure? APU switch off, abort start. Abort start. What does abort start mean? Engine condition levers to stop, motor engines and monitor for the temperatures. Okay, I've cranked the APU during flight. I've got an APU fire. Now this is common sense. You guys are AQC. Remember our Flight School 21 gentlemen here are beat rote memorization, rote memorization. A flight engineer comes over to the intercom and says, I've got a fire on APU, I've got a fire on the APU. That Flight School 21 student may not realize, hey, I'm flying. He's gonna reach up there, APU fire, the APU switch off, abort start. Not a bad, not a good scenario for being in the air. But if we're on the ground, that would apply. APU switch off, an abort start. If we're flying and the APU catches on fire, there are other emergency procedures that we go to. We have in-flight fuselage fire. You would follow those procedures. If I'm during shutdown, and I crank the APU and I have an APU fire. APU fire does not go out, then I've got a fuselage fire on the ground. There are procedures for that. So use the common sense that most people have developed by now on the aviation. Again, that's a scenario driven um, emergency procedure, APU switch off, abort start. That would probably be to me, tell me we're doing that during startup. 
take the other scenarios and slow down. If I'm in the air, you know I'm not going to do an abort start. I will look for the other emergency procedures. If I'm shutting down, then I'm going to look for a fuselage fire on the ground. Any questions? No questions at all. Let me throw a couple at you then. To go back to Jeff's question real quick about the battery, it seems like on 34 they're alluding to should you should record the flight information and then turn the battery off at the very bottom and throw it at the Okay. It's the same as you was on the black one. Yes. You know on that one, if you turn the battery off, it does reset the, the lights. Okay. Bowlegs number seven, you're correct. If the APU start is not completed or APU is shut down automatically, go ahead and record the byte information, but it should, it probably will not reset, but that's in case it does do it. Not all of them have been changed around, but go ahead and record it before we touch the battery switch off. Or maybe, yeah, okay. I was thinking APU switch. I apologize. That is correct. I was thinking APU switch. I think if you turn the APU switch off, it's not going to affect it, but he was correct. You're correct. If you cut the battery switch off, it will reset it. Thank you, sir, for didn't want to leave anybody with bad information. Any other questions? All right. What components are driven by the APU? APU motor pump and APU mm -hmm. generator. APU motor pump, APU generator, and you could uh, fuel control is driven. But those are the main two components. How long must the APU switch be held at the start position during start procedure? Three to five seconds. Two? Two seconds. Three to five seconds of run, two for start. I don't have that slide up there again, but remember, whenever we get through the start, that two seconds, release it slowly. If I pull my finger through that start switch, it is sprung loaded back to the run position. If I pull my th finger through it, I'm going to aid that spring and to go into the run and back to the off position, and then myself or Tom's going to be back there in the back pumping it up because we pull through that switch. How long should we wait if the APU fails to start before we start it again? One minute. APU on light should come on within 30 seconds. The utility hydraulic light should, capsule light should go off within 30 seconds. 